These grainy images from a jail surveillance camera captured one of the last days of Madeline Pitkin's life. What do we know about Madeline's final hours or day? Suffered greatly. Suffered greatly. Nobody came to her. On April 17, 2014, Madeline was booked on a drug charge at a jail in Oregon. That's her, slumped down and struggling to stand as her body goes through heroin withdrawal. She died three days later after pleading for help from the jail's for-profit medical contractor, a company called Corizon. The chaplain from the jail and another police officer came to my door. I was not expecting that she would, they would tell me she was dead, that's for sure. Corizon settled a lawsuit accusing them of wrongful death, gross negligence, and reckless misconduct. She could have been saved with a simple IV. A bag of saline solution would have saved Madeline Pitkin's life. As jails in the U.S. struggle to treat inmates with addictions or chronic medical conditions, they're increasingly turning to for-profit health care providers. But there's a growing number of lawsuits against the handful of companies in this business. The idea that companies that provide bad service, that injure or kill people, will eventually lose customers and go out of business, just don't apply in the prison and jail sector. And that's because there's no consumer choice. It's not like the prisoner can say, I'm going to go down the road and see if the health care is better at, at this other jail. When you combine the profit motive with a literally captive market of unpopular people, it's a recipe for bad outcomes and often lethal outcomes. Fault Lines investigates what happens when the health care of prisoners is put in the hands of for-profit companies. Was she an athlete? Is it volleyball? Volleyball. Yeah. She was a good swimmer um, and played volleyball. And her last year in high school, she also did crew. She was very determined to make it on her own. She was uh, a wonderful person. When you look back on it, when did things start to go off track for Madeline? It was just very gradual, a yeah. gradual thing. You just never imagine that that's going to happen to your family or someone you love. You know, you just don't, you don't even, that, that's not the first place you go, yeah, that they're having trouble with drugs, you know. When she was booked at the jail, Madeline told Horizon Medical staff that she used heroin. When she was picked up, was there any part of you that thought, well, this would be a good chance for her to be in some safe hands to maybe recover? Yeah, actually, yes, we did think that. And yeah, we didn't, at the time, think anything, you know, bad would happen to her where she was. She was a beautiful young lady with a lot of potential. Withdrawing from heroin and desperate to see a doctor, Madeline sent four written medical requests to Corizon. Those requests were largely ignored, and she died of dehydration in her cell on her eighth day in jail. She was 26 years old. It was heartbreaking when we found out that uh, she had actually asked for help multiple times and Nothing happened, and it was, I'm sorry. A couple of days after they, she was detained at the jail, she writes, heroin withdrawal. I told medical uh, at intake that I was detoxing, and they said I was not yet sick enough to start meds. Now I am in full-blown withdrawals and I really need medical care. In all caps, please help with an exclamation point. Madeline's fourth request for help, the day before she died, read as follows. This is a third or fourth call for help. I haven't been able to keep food, liquids, meds down in six days. I feel like I'm very close to death. Can't hear, seeing lights, hearing voices. Please help me. This really strikes me that the last three days, four days of her life, she's saying, I feel near death. What's truly shocking is that that, that 
did not elicit some kind of reasonable response out of the healthcare staff. I'll tell you that I did conduct de depositions of healthcare providers that were involved in Madeline's care, several of whom told me that this is pretty typical stuff, this is pretty usual thing, uh, we see this from time to time. I also wonder if it doesn't come from kind of a broader dehumanization of the people who were in jail and a kind of a bias to, to not trust or listen to them. Let's begin with this. It's difficult work. Uh, this is a troubled population. And I think uh, that has to be extremely taxing on the medical staff. And they see the, the patients as manipulative, mm -hmm. uh, not being straight with them. They don't take them seriously. After Madeline died, a criminal investigation showed Corizon staff kept sloppy records and couldn't account for when Madeline was seen. And a 2014 audit found that nearly 20% of the time, there wasn't even a registered nurse on duty. We tracked down a physician's assistant to work for Corizon at the same jail where Madeline died. I was concerned for my medical license. There were several times when we had some pretty near misses nice and it really, it, it scared me. She quit less than a year before Madeline's death because she was concerned about the company's quality of care. This is the first time she's spoken publicly. What was it like working for Horizon then? So they were hiring people who were right out of school. They were chronically understaffed. So the people that were there were undertrained, and they would pressure me to connect with the correctional department and get the patient released as soon as like they had a major medical problem, which sometimes did happen. From my recollection, if they were released like before the ambulance got there, then Corizon was not on the hook for their medical bill. And so they would quick try to expedite their release. How do they respond to your concerns? Corizon's response was to retaliate against me. I was written up twice for very, very minor things that I, it was extremely clear to me that they were just giving me pushback about um, me raising these concerns. We asked Horizon about these allegations and they said that the company strictly forbids retaliation. This is a for-profit model and it is the relentless pursuit of profit by this corporation that led to them to understaff this jail. The company settled with Russ and Mary Pitkin for $10 million. Do you feel like you got justice? No, not really. I mean... What would justice look like to you? Well, there would definitely be change. Yeah, and, and they mean all they do is talk or, you know, say, well, we're make, making changes, but do they? Do they really make changes? I believe that the for-profit uh, needs to change. I don't know if you get rid of for-profit, but it needs to be, it needs to be changed um, because people are dying. Madeline's case is not the only one. According to the New Yorker magazine, Corizon has been named in more than a thousand lawsuits alleging malpractice, neglect, or wrongful injury or death. Clinical excellence is the cornerstone of the health care provided by Corizon every day. It is our mission to deliver safe, effective, and efficient services. The company no longer has a contract with any prison or jail in Oregon, but it's operating in 16 other states with at least 145,000 prisoners under its care. Corizon declined to give us an interview and instead sent us a statement saying, quote, Corizon continues to focus on expanding the delivery of quality, evidence-based care that meets the needs of our clients and the population we serve. Companies offering services to prisons and jails boomed in the 1980s. I hope we can count on your support in our war on crime and our efforts to protect the innocent and put the professional criminals in jail where they belong. When tough on crime policies started putting record numbers of people behind bars, eager entrepreneurs lined up to take on lucrative contracts selling themselves as cheaper and more efficient than government agencies. It worked. For-profit companies provide some part of prison health care in more than half of states, according to one study. Both prisons and jails uh, have been increasingly outsourcing uh, their health care to private for-profit corporations. Uh, sometimes it's uh, 
as in response to these claims that they can do it better and more cheaply. Do these companies save the counties and states money? And if so, how, how do they save them money? Well, there's no evidence that they save money. And that's because it's, it's highly implausible that they could save money. Again, if they're trying to provide the same service and yet generate a profit for their stockholders, which of course a government agency doesn't have to do, it's not clear how they could do that. Do you think that Madeline might have received better care had that facility been run by the county rather than for a for-profit organization? In my experience, the health care provided by government entities is better than what happens with for-profit companies. There's more accountability uh, for that care. It is this profit motive that continues to interfere with adequate health care being provided to people who are detained and incarcerated across the country. We visited the jail where Madeline was held, just outside of Portland, Oregon. A year after her death, Corizon was replaced by another healthcare contractor called NAVCARE. The total contract amount was more than $28 million over five years. Leave the day-to-day -day hospital routine behind. Apply with NAVCARE today. But NAVCARE comes with its own history of medical misconduct lawsuits and settlements. At least two inmates have died under NAFCARE's watch in this jail since Madeline's death in 2014. There are at least five open lawsuits against NAFCARE, I think, with your jail now. They allege medical neglect. Um, I, I'm not, I'm just not acquainted with the details of those, of those lawsuits. Pat Garrett is the elected sheriff of Washington County. He was in charge of this jail when Madeline Pitkin died. But if you're looking at a company like Horizon who settled for $10 million in the case that happened in this jail, you, you must be wary of bringing in an, another company that has open lawsuits like that with similar accusations. As the sheriff, <laughs> you know, we, we use experts here uh, from, from various disciplines who are looking through their own lens so that together we make sure that we're doing, we're doing the right thing. We're going through the campaign donations and noticed that two individuals from NAFCARE donated to your campaign, $2,000 each. Yep. They live 2,500 miles from here. Why do you think they're donating to your campaign? Um, I, you know, I don't, I don't, you'll have to ask them. Do you, do you think they, that they see that as a way of influence? I, I, I think that, uh, that uh, they, they want to support leaders that they have confidence in. NAFCARE has had contracts in Nevada jails since 2005. We got an opportunity to tour the Washoe County Jail in Reno, Nevada. Um, yeah, the watch will probably set it up. We don't escort inmates if they're going down to medical, if they're going to work, if they're going around the facility. We don't escort them. They go by themselves. But we weren't allowed to film NAFCARE staff or activities. In 2015, NAFCARE got a contract for more than $4 million with this jail. A little over two years later, 13 inmates had died, a 600% spike in the jail's death rate, according to the Reno Gazette Journal. Are you satisfied with NAFCARE? So I would say since I've taken office, yes. There have been four deaths in the jail just this year since Darren Balaam was sworn in as the new sheriff. Three were suicides, and the fourth died from a medical condition. At what point do you feel like you might need to draw the line here and reassess who's providing health care? When we see consistent errors, the same errors, or a majority of, of errors uh, in medical, where people aren't getting the appropriate medical care, that is the key for me of, okay, then we need to reassess. Campaign finance records show that NAVCARE also donated to this sheriff. When you ran for election last year, did you receive over $10,000 from NAVCARE? I did. Campaign donations? Can you see how that might appear as a conflict of interest when you're also the one that will decide whether they stay in the jail or not? That's why I have a commitment to make sure that any issues here um, are brought forth, no matter if they donated to my campaign or not. If not, I know absolutely this community is going to hold me responsible, and I will definitely take action to make sure that care is held to the highest standard. But it's not good care overall. You're just a number. That's all you are. They don't, they don't care at all. Eric Blankenship 
was in and out of the Washoe County Jail in 2018. He says he had four seizures there because NAFCARE staff refused to give him his anti-seizure medication. I have seizures because I have chronic migraine syndrome, mm. and um, the medication is clonazepam, one milligram. Um, and uh, NAFCARE, who is the medical facility inside Washoe County Jail, refuses to give that to anyone whatsoever. There's a, uh, a couple other people in there that took that as well, and um, they were denied it as well. So when you went there and NAVCARE said no, they, they couldn't give it to you, could you actually go through withdrawals from that? Yes, you can actually die from not taking it. What happened when you started to withdraw? Yeah, I, I had a seizure, you sweat, and you go through actual withdrawals, and I seized. When you saw the doctor, how would you describe his attitude towards your condition? It was, I, I'm not sure that he, cared or not, it, he just said, it, it, it was, he just said, you can't have it. So, I mean, it's a, it was, there was no gray area, it's yes or no. He said no. So there's nothing I could do. We asked NAVCARE about Eric's case, but they said they don't comment on issues of patient care. Yeah. All right. Sometimes there are rules that don't make sense or aren't as necessary as they seem. Dr. Mark Stern used to work in correctional health care and is a national expert on the topic. Certainly money factors into it. If the medication is expensive, there is at least an interest on the part of the company to not give it to preserve, to, to not spend extra money. You have someone that has seizures. What, what kind of risk do they run if you cold turkey pull them off of a prescription like that. If you take that medication away suddenly, not only are they gonna have seizures at the rate that they had them before, but they may have more seizures or worse seizures initially in those first few hours or days because you've taken something away abruptly as opposed to taking it away slowly. What argument do you make that says they should provide better medical treatment in their jail? Well, it matters because it's your health. I mean, you want to survive, right? That's all anybody wants. Hello, please leave a message after the tone. NAFCARE declined our request for an on-camera interview. A lot of jails have NAFCARE providing that healthcare service. I'd like to ask you some questions about that. If you can call me back. Instead, they wrote us an email that says, quote, all of our protocols adhere to the strictest national standards and guidelines to ensure clinical excellence in the health and safety of our patients. NAFCARE operates in more than 50 jails and prisons in at least 20 states, according to its website. In the summer of 2018, the company had a contract at the Clark County Detention Center in Las Vegas. Ida Jones's husband, Willie Lewis, was at the jail when he became ill and asked NAVCARE staff for medical help at least five times over 10 days. He couldn't eat anything, he couldn't hold anything down, and he felt like he couldn't breathe, and he said that they were just telling him it was flu symptoms, and he kept telling them, it's, it's more than that, I really can't breathe. And when you saw him, what, what happened? What... I seen him coming towards the window, but he was limping, and he looked at really fatigued, um, and he was very sweaty. And so when he came to the window, um, I said, you still don't feel better? And I, he said, no. And I said, <sighs> and I said, I don't want to leave you because you look really bad. <laughs> and he said, I know, baby, but they're not going to, uh, they're not going to do anything. They don't care. Three months after entering the jail, Willie died after his diabetes went undiagnosed and untreated. His organs shut down from not having enough insulin. As far as you know, he never saw a medical doctor? No, never seen a doctor. Ida is suing NAFCARE for wrongful death. If they hadn't denied him to go to the hospital, they would have known that he just needed some insulin. He was lacking insulin, so his whole body shut down. In addition to Willie's case, there are at least seven open legal complaints against NAVCARE at the Clark County Detention Center. A 2016 audit of the jail found that NAVCARE didn't operate an infirmary, give medications to inmates upon release, and offered limited mental health programs. Part of the reason we don't know more about jail deaths under for-profit care 
is because some of the companies rely on confidentiality agreements to keep details of the cases secret. There are settlements across the country on these cases. And included in every one of those settlements, I'll bet, is, a, is, a, is a, an agreement, a confidentiality clause that bars the lawyers and all the people involved from talking about the case. So you never really get to hear about what happened. NAVCARE included a confidentiality agreement when it settled a lawsuit with the family of Luis Solano, who died in jail custody in 2013. Like Willie, Luis was also held at the Clark County Detention Center. According to the lawsuit, when he entered the jail, Luis told NAVCARE staff that he took Xanax for anxiety. But NAVCARE denied him the medication. Luis went into withdrawal, acting delirious and erratic. This video shows officers responding to his behavior. They pinned him to the ground until he passed out. He died 10 days later from the way the officers restrained him. Had he been medicated, I think that he would have never ended up in a psychiatric unit. He would have never had an episode. He would have never, it would have never escalated to an anxiety attack like the ones he used to get. And I think that he would have never run into those officers. Carmen Solano was 18 when her father died. Two years later, she settled a lawsuit with NAVCARE for wrongful death. As part of the terms of the settlement, Carmen agreed to a confidentiality clause. I know that this has been difficult talking to us. Why was it important for you to do so? After my dad died and after we buried him and during the lawsuit and the challenge that that was, um, it was very present for me that I needed to do something. I know that the lawsuit itself maybe didn't have quite the impact that my family wanted, but everything that I do from here on does. This is the first time she's spoken publicly about the confidentiality agreement. You chose to settle? <clears throat> yes. Why? I wanted to end it. They had dragged it on for so long, every, every single tactic in the book to delay things, to push hearings, to um, protect evidence, to deny it from us. So we came to the table just kind of defeated. Why do you think it was important to NAFCARE for you to agree to a non-disparagement agreement? I can't answer that. <clears throat> you can't say? Why? That means that I can't say anything uh, publicly that would directly or indirectly um, make them look bad. The impact of these clauses uh, is to prevent the truth from coming forward. And I think in many ways it stunts the change that needs to happen, the accountability that should occur. As Ida pushes for accountability for her husband's death, she's also trying to recover from the devastation it's caused her family. Lost everything. Just now, uh, me and my son was basically homeless. Uh, we were going like from house to house, from like my kids' house, friends' houses. He was a breadwinner. Um, I started driving Uber because after my husband passed away, he, he, we didn't have insurance. I had no way to bury him. And um, we had to get out and do car washes. We did dinner, we sold plates. We went on the corners and begged for money because I'm in debt. I'm trying to bury my husband, to give him a proper burial. When you look into these stories one by one around the country and you talk to the parents, the family members, the friends, the siblings, you're gonna hear similar stories just like Madeline's from all over the country. This is needless. It shouldn't happen. There really are very few safeguards. Obviously the prisoners have nothing to say about whether this company gets to keep the contract or not. That decision is made by the prison officials and they're going to be looking at the bottom line. They're going to be looking at who has the lowest bid. 
Medical outcomes is not a goal of for-profit healthcare. It's how do we provide the cheapest care, whatever, whatever they're not spending, they get to take home. I, if I could do it all over again, I would go to trial. I think that if I had been given that platform um, to, to tell somebody, somebody who cares, then maybe other people wouldn't be dying in prisons all the time. We all have loved ones, you know, and just because they made the wrong decision and they go to jail don't mean you have to treat them like they're animals or, you know, they don't have family, they don't have loved ones.